you know, they get sick and they come to the hospital expecting that we're going to have all the answers and that they're going to come out of the hospital like they were, you know, five years ago. But we don't. And their level of frustration is like a realization of, oh, wow, this, this enormous power I've believed in, it's not as almighty as I used to think it is. And it's not. I, I realized that in medical school, and a lot of my co-physicians realized this during their career, and that's why a lot of physicians are so burnt out and so mistrusting of the system. Welcome back to the Zoom Out podcast. I'm your host, Tim Niemeyer. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with Dr. Ahmad Amous, board-certified internal medicine physician. Ahmad, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Thank you, Tim. Happy to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure for me. Uh, we were talking offline. This topic that we're going to talk about is near and dear to my heart. Uh, not just, not just health and how you know, uh, food, natural medicine is actually the way to stay healthy as opposed to what we have today with just drugs and everything. But it it, it hits me personally because I went through a lot of that stuff growing up. Now I'll probably, like I said, overshare a little bit. But uh, before we get into any of that. Um, Share with us. Give us a little bit of your backstory. Like, did you always want to be into medicine? Was that like a calling growing up? Uh, how did, how did yeah. you get to where you are? Yeah, my father is a physician, and when you tend to grow up in like a physician household, you kind of like gravitate toward that career path. So I always saw myself as being a physician, and you don't know much about medicine when you're not in it. And when I when I got into medical school, I was just appalled that we're not really curing anyone. We're just managing disease. We're just kicking the can down the road and we're just adding on more and more medications to people with more and more side effects. And uh, it was at that same time that I started reading about the paleo diet and went on the paleo diet. Mm. And I just had enormous improvements in my health. And I just started reading more and more about how important diet is to health. And it really made me realize why don't we do this in in modern medicine and that yeah yeah um so i'm, I'm just curious what what kind of because i've heard a lot of doctors say that a similar thing to where we're trained we're trained we're trained we think we're doing all the right things and then we start to see really that we're not really helping you know um it, you know what does that hippocratic oath first do no harm what were some of the things that you read early on that kind of helped you start to shift perspective yeah, I mean, so probably the most the most challenging diseases that we see are autoimmune diseases. People just have joint issues and they wake up in pain and they sleep in pain and all their joints hurt. And you look at all the best pharmaceutical medications out for it. And the most they do is, you know, they decrease the pain from being 8 out of 10 to being 6 out of 10. And <laughs> those come with a lot of side effects and they're expensive and... And you have to be on them for life. And so that got me curious. And I started reading about just randomly through paleo blogs about people who've 100% cured their diseases just by fixing their diet. And I'm like, this makes a lot more sense than taking a medication, you know, and because you're treating the root cause. Yeah, I, I saw a... Um just one of those memes today that said 90% um, of the foods that we eat today weren't around 100 years ago. I, I'm sure the numbers are not accurate, but there are now 90% more types of uh, ailment, you know, problems that we have physically, uh, medically. Uh, so I see what you're saying. I totally agree with you. Like, for example, I had you know, for decades, depression. I had these weird shooting pains all over the body that nobody could suggest. And what was the solution? It was always this drug or that drug. And okay, I'm young and dumb and I'm going to trust, you know, the, the expert. And you're right. There were side effects. Like I never felt good per se. I felt slightly better, but I also felt zombified in certain ways. And, and, my, and my personal journey, um, see, I didn't go straight to paleo. I, I kind of came about it uh, like I found, do you, are you familiar with Dr. Stephen Gundry, the, the plant paradox? He has, yes. a, he has a series of books. And, and that started getting me into the idea that, wait a minute, it's, <laughs> it, it, we, feed, we fix ourselves from the inside out, right? We fix ourselves from our gut. So 
I was reading uh, some of your tweets, if, if just to kind of round this out a little bit, this the whole yeah. problem of side effects. You, you've been saying a lot of stuff about the sun and how sunlight's good, right? Uh, can, of course. Can you give us a little uh, insight into, because the, everything that I hear in the media is sun, sun is bad, you know, slap on a bunch of, you know, sunscreen and stay out of the light. Yeah, so probably as as devil devilish as the vilification of uh, meat and fat in our diet is the vilification of the sun and uh, what what the what the standard dermatologist or standard doctor will tell you is that uh, the sun increases your risk of skin cancer but if you actually look at the studies it increases the risk of you getting benign skin tumors which don't which don't really ever cause mortality. And the, actually the melanoma, the deadly form of skin cancer, the sun reduces its incidence. It's, and <laughs> it, it's, not, it's not associated with sun exposure. So, so if you, that, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so that's the first step of why the sun is vilified. But then you look at all the research that shows what the benefits of the sun are. And it's just ginormous. And it's a lot more than just vitamin D. It's directly charging your mitochondria. It's helping your neurotransmitters. It's helping your circadian rhythm. And none of that is talked about because you can't really patent the sun. <laughs> I have heard you say that a few times and I love that. Um, so my question then is why just in the last, I don't know, 70, 50, 70, 80 years, has that become an issue? Because I think maybe going back cavemen and all the way up, it didn't seem like this was as big of a deal. How did this become a big deal all of a sudden? So it became more of a big deal because we're spending more and more time indoors. So when we are exposed to the sun, people don't tend to do it gradually or be wise about their exposure. So they tend to get sunburned. And so people associate the sun with bad things, just as getting burned and stuff. But if you... So there if you are gradually building your sun callus with the beginning of spring where you're spending more and more time outdoors, you never need sunscreen and you're never going to get sunburned. So there's a hormetic response, like, you know, you got to building up a tolerance of sort. Exactly. So I've also heard, I've also heard, and like anytime I try and talk this out with family or friends, they just look at me crazy, but like going back to the, the gut kind of is the, where all the autoimmune it, it issues start there's also that uh, idea of seed oils and how that's basically like to simplify it i guess tell me if i'm right or wrong you're cooking yourself from the inside it's like you wouldn't take vegetable oil rub it on your skin and go out in the sun right so it, does that have a, a meaningful effect too 100 percent. i mean our intake of fish uh, seed oils are going up and our people getting burned is going up too and you listen to a lot of people that tell you i stopped using seed oils and I stopped getting burned. And what, what seed oils are, I mean, seed oils, are, yeah. What seed oils are, are they are, uh, they're unbalanced fats. They have a lot of free radicals and they tend to displace the fats in your cell membranes and they make the, your cell membranes more fragile for sun damage. <laughs> so this is crazy. Um, so when we start to talk about like, you know, the, the problems that Fiat brings to me, um, what I gathered from my last interview with uh, Matthew Leshak, author of uh, Fiat Food, is that we had to start pumping these oils into, into the food supply because it was cheaper, you know, like because the uh, inflation and all of these other factors. So now we have seed oils in our, in our bodies, which makes us less or more susceptible to burning. And then we slap on a bunch of sunscreen, which I, what, what's the what, what's really going on there with the sunscreen? It, it like endocrine endocrine disruptors, something to that effect. Yeah, so they're also like fats that are products of industry that they they want to get rid of and find the use for. So that's a win. And the, the main issue with them is that so anything you put on your skin, your skin is your biggest organ. Anything you put on the skin is absorbed into your bloodstream. And most of these substances are endocrine disruptors, which mean they have similar structures to our hormones. 
and they would bind our hormonal receptors and prevent your own hormones from acting on. And so that's not good. You know, if you're a man, you're basically, (laughs) you're blocking your testosterone. If you're a woman, you're blocking your estrogen. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of bad side effects from them. So uh, like my, I've talked to my wife about that and we've uh, adjusted to like the zinc based kind of sunscreen for our kids. So I I, Mm -hmm. I guess that's at least a little bit of a, a little bit better. We're still putting stuff on our sin. And I guess there's a, just like everything else, there's a zinc deficiency in humans, I would assume. <laughs> so at least I have that yeah. going on. Yeah, it's it's better than uh, the usual uh, star, bo- the, your typical standard uh, sunscreen. But I, ideally, you would want to get to the point where you don't need it, which is which, which is, takes some work. It's not easy. So <clears throat> if we kind of like use that as a study, we got we got ourselves eating poor food because the fiat money. Now we're having side effects, which cause us to add more chemicals to our body, which, like you said, blocks testosterone in men and was it estrogen in women? Yeah. yeah. So now we're creating this vicious cycle and now we're not going to go even go out in the sun because the sun is bad and not going out in the sun <laughs> makes us less able to be in the sun. Are we turning ourselves into zombies here? What I mean, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if you if you look at the medical system, it people are just getting sicker and sicker, and hospitals are getting more and more overwhelmed. And uh, I don't know what the end of this is. Like, so I, I work in a I work in Boston. I work around the Boston area. If you, the hospitals here, every day of the year, they're basically on something called cold disaster, where there's just <laughs> more patients than there are beds. People sleeping in the hallways. And I don't know what's going to happen. People need to wake up. Yeah, no, and I totally agree. And, and what you're doing and, and what, what I'm trying to do in my own small way is help people understand this. So as you know, this is just a Bitcoin-based show. And we, we're starting to see more how fiat kind of ruins everything to steal from Jimmy Song. And... Uh, we're starting to see how Bitcoin fixes things. You know, the Bitcoin fixes this. It is kind of like overused in Bitcoin, but there's a lot of validity to that. So before we get into how maybe Bitcoin fixes health, uh, could you give us your ba- uh, background story, your Bitcoin orange pill journey? Like, how did you get from doctor to this Bitcoin, you know, kind of help solve this in a way? Yeah, so when I was in med school, I lived, I moved in with my brother who, who was in Lebanon then. My brother is Seyfedina Mous, the author of the Bitcoin Standard. And before there was a Bitcoin Standard, he would just sit and talk to me for hours and hours about, you know, <laughs> fiat and uh, Austrian economics and how Bitcoin fixes uh, it. I bet. Uh, this was before he all wrote it down. So I, I was the first. Uh, you were the sounding first, board. Yeah, the first audience. <laughs> And I mean, once you see it, it was at that same time that I was getting introduced to Bitcoin that I understood how, how bad the fiat medical system is. And once you understand how terrible the money is, you kind of understand why, how c- terrible systems such as the medical system come, come out of it. So and you can't understand the solution without understanding the problem kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And it applies to all factors of life. It's just fiat ruins it, you know? So a sidebar, um, for those who know uh, your brother, Safety, aside from being the author of the Bitcoin Standard, he is probably, and I mean this affectionately, my favorite troll on the internet. Yeah. Like, he is relentless. And that made me wonder, like, I I have to guess you have the thickest skin of anybody alive, because growing up as kids, was he just like a complete bully? Like, older brother just... uh, I'm not trying to throw him under the bus here, but like, <laughs> so he's he's actually 11 years older than me. So he he left for college when I was pretty young. Okay. So I didn't get that much uh, teasing. My sister did, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he, he's good at it. He's good at it. Bless bless her. Yeah, yeah, he is. So so it's through him that you get into Bitcoin. And how long have you been in? Uh, how long have you been studying? 
So I, I went into medical school in 2013. Okay. And that's uh, when you, that's also when you got into Bitcoin then? I would say probably 2014, 2015 was when I, I really started taking it seriously. Okay. And uh, yeah, because I'm, I'm class of 18. So I was a few years behind you. So I'm yeah. playing catch up. <clears throat> so let's, let's shift this then. We, we kind of like highlighted how fiat it, it causes all these negative uh, incentives, right? It's, it's, it's just a negative incentive structure, you know? It's always a centralizing force. So the people who can, who want power, get power through the money supply, as opposed to like providing a value or a service to society. Um, and that leads to further issues with, uh, you know, what is that called? Lobbying and, and big pharma, big food. Like there wouldn't be a, in my mind, there wouldn't be a big pharma, big food, any big, anything on a Bitcoin standard. It's just good ideas and people solving situations for others, you know, solving things for others would lead to their wealth. So specifically when we're talking about health, what do you see? How do you see uh, Bitcoin fixing this? Hey y'all, are you need a Bitcoin? You looking for a way to safely and securely store your Bitcoin? Check out the Bitcoin advisors. These Bitcoiners are professionals that will provide you peace of mind so you can sleep soundly at night knowing your Bitcoin is safe. Remember to tell them, Zoom out sent you. I guess the, the main issue is that there is there is no freedom currently to practice the type of medicine you want to practice, and and that's the main issue. There's a central government agency, the American Medical Association, which dictates that this is the type of medicine we want to teach in medical school. Anyone that anyone that teaches anything different or practices anything different is illegal and needs to be put in jail, and does cannot have a license. So that sort of authority doesn't come out of nowhere. That sort of authority comes from a big government that's funded by fiat, that's funded by money printing. If you just leave it up to the market, anyone who practices anything that's beneficial to people, people are going to see, oh, this guy is helping me, and they're going to go to him. And that's how a free market works. So medicine is not a free market, and it's not a free market because of fiat money. Yeah, that makes sense. So the hard question for me always is, I do like, I, I assume like you, I envision a future on a Bitcoin standard where health, maybe not everybody's healthy, you know, because personal choice is a thing. And who am I to say, if there's like, if we have a structural problem, we need to fix that. But at the end of the day, you know, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make a drink, right? You can't, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it eat seed oil. <laughs> That's a exactly, horrible yeah. analogy. <laughs> I'm going to, uh, but you can make it eat seed oil, whatever. So my, my problem with all this and the thing that I can't wrap my head around, and I'm going to, I'm throwing you a, a hardball here is like the transition, the transition from a fiat standard to a Bitcoin standard. Let's, let's maybe focus in on, on the health. There's going to be some problems along the way. Like, do you see any of those problems? Do you have any solutions? What, what are your thoughts on that, on our transition to a Bitcoin standard? It, it's not going to be easy. It's, there's probably going to be a lot of scammers that are trying to, you know, bring people, tell them that this, is, this, uh, this treatment is the cure. And, but you have to shake up the system in order to improve anything, you know. And there's, there's going to be a growing phase. There's going to be some growing pains, but we, we will hopefully improve things. And there are models out there of people who are doing practicing medicine as it should hmm. be on a free market scale. So uh, th there's this clinic in Oklahoma called the Oklahoma Surgical Clinic where you go for surgeries and you pay by cash yeah. only. And they're... Their costs for every surgery is orders of magnitude less, and their quality of delivery is much more than any standard uh, hospital out there. And uh, that's well, sh more and more of these people are going to be able to prosper under a Bitcoin standard. And that's you the know, whole. shout 
Yeah, shout out to uh, Andy Schoonover from Crowd Health. He's the one I first heard about that Oklahoma clinic. And, that, and so I, I can see free market will help bring down prices. And then my thought is hopefully Bitcoin, it's going to help those who are in the system. It's not going to help those outside of the system as much. Maybe over the long span, over the long term it might. But um, those in the system, they'll be able to afford things like a ribeye, you know what I mean, to, to live. Because the problem, you see people loading up their carts at the grocery store. It's overflowing, but the amount of nutrition in that grocery cart is minuscule. There, there's Settle. zero nutrition. It's all, it's all empty calories, in my estimation. I... I, I'm trying. To, I'm trying to envision a world in the the interim that is a smooth transition, and I don't really have it. So maybe let me ask a diff, Let me ask it a different way. For those people who might not be on a Bitcoin standard or fully invest in Bitcoin or just now kind of a bit curious, if you will, like what are, besides study Bitcoin? What are some of those things health wise that they could and should be doing? Or do you have like a list of like tenants that must do's in order to get yourself I think to better the best help. way to start is you have to realize that you need you need to become your own doctor this entire model of you need a primary care physician who cares for you for everything I think that's faulty because it takes away responsibility from you and gives it to someone else you need to be responsible for your health uh, and it's once you get a certain level of healthy, once you cut out the seed oils and the sugars, usually, then your body becomes very sensitive to what, what things in your lifestyle make you feel good or not good. And once you reach that point, 90% of people don't even need healthcare, you know? <laughs> once you reach that point, if, if, something, if, if you introduce something to your diet or introduce something in your lifestyle, you're going to feel that it's making you feel bad. Yeah. And this, this is the first step in dismantling this enormously huge and enormously ineffective medical system is to get people to rely on themselves. You know, and I see that as the problem, as a big problem, because our fiat system, the way it's structured, almost begets or creates um, a class of people who will rely on others to solve their problems for them. Like when you have subsidies and handouts and you know just relentless money printing you're creating that class of people who won't be their own doctor they will just go mindlessly to somebody who's incentivized to give pills and say what should i have to make me feel better here's some pills it's it's quite it's quite sad to see i mean i practice here in the us and to just see people that are completely you know, they get sick and they come to the hospital expecting that we're going to have all the answers and that they're going to come out of the hospital like they were, you know, five years ago. But we don't. And their level of frustration, it's like a realization of, oh, wow, this, this enormous power I've believed in, it's not as almighty as I used to think it is. And it's not. And it, it, I realized that in medical school and a lot of my co-physicians realize this during their career. And that's why a lot of physicians are so burnt out and so mistrusting of the system. So uh, what, so then let's maybe focus on what, how are you, cause you're, are you, do you consider yourself still in the system? Do you, how are you trying to break out? Cause it, it's gotta be tough. It's gotta be tough being, that's your job, but yet you're seeing yeah. this, this other way. Yeah, so how are you breaking I mean, outside of that? Yeah, unfortunately, I am still in the fiat system. Uh, I need to because I am waiting on my visa and green card issues to be resolved. And this, in order to do that, you need to have a hospital that sponsors you. And mm. hospitals just work on the fiat model. My plan is to start online, but hopefully eventually get to where I have my own clinic and I just see my own patients and can do whatever I want. And uh, yeah. the, the, the difficulty with that is that there's always risk because so the, how doctors are 
captured by the system is that there are there are guidelines on how to practice. So if someone has elevated cholesterol and you don't put them on a cholesterol medication, which I don't believe in, I believe they're poison, you are technically legally liable if anything happens to them a few years from now. Because the are you talking about stay. Are you talking about statins or something? Statins, yes. Statins are probably the most toxic medications in history. Can you and, tell me about uh, that? Because I, I don't have that. I don't have that in, in, in myself or my family, so I'm not. I've heard of them, but uh, could you describe so, that for the listener? Uh, the vilification of fat started with the, the vilification of cholesterol, and it was this researcher called Ansel Keys who did this study called the Seven Country Study, where he looked at saturated fat intake and rates of cardiovascular disease. So this was in the 1950s. The rates of cardiovascular disease just skyrocketed then, and everyone was trying to find out why. His theory, he, he showed that with these seven countries, with their increased saturated fat intake, they had more heart disease. People later found out is that he eliminated many studies in order to find that result. The cherry but, picking, yeah. Yeah, but, but that result was just, it was exactly what the food and drug industry wanted. So the food industry used that to vilify meat and fat and instead sell you protein that's plant-based and seed oils. That's one. And then the, the elevated cholesterol was seen, was seen as, okay, cholesterol is a saturated fat. We need to cut down on the cholesterol in the blood and that will lead to improving the cardiovascular disease. And that brought on the most popular drugs in history, which are statins. And if you look at the studies that, sh that analyze statins, the benefit is very minimal. And, but the side effects are horrible. The side effects include neurological diseases, cardiovascular diseases, and even basic things as weakness and muscle pains. And this is the most, the highest selling drug in history. Jesus. Yeah. So you're, you're to the, and what you were saying earlier is that you're held liable. If you, if they have a certain condition and you don't uh, prescribe statins, you're liable for that. Is that what I heard? So that's, that's basically how the system is captured. Uh, Oof. Yeah. So the doctors don't benefit directly from prescribing statins. Like I'm not getting paybacks from drug companies for prescribing a statin. Who gets paybacks is, for example, the American College of Cardiology or the American Endocrine Society. These are the, these are the societies that set the guidelines for medical practice. And they tell you if someone's cholesterol is this level, you have to prescribe a statin. And technically your membership in that society and your membership as a physician is on the line if you don't do what they're told. These societies and, get money directly from pharmaceutical companies. So they're back to that whole fiat disincentive or incentive disincentive, however you look at it. Exactly. Wow. Wow. So th then uh, you mentioned uh, way earlier about how you went to a paleo diet. I've been through all types. And the one I'm currently on, I think we're similar. Uh, I don't know specifically the differences. I kind of have followed Paul Salandino's uh, kind of um, animal-based diet. Nice. Is, is, are, are we pretty similar there between the, that and paleo? I'm pretty similar. I, I mean, the most important thing for me in diet is just being mostly animal-based. So you want to have animal protein and fat at every meal. And... Once you get to that point, if you want to have some things on the side, if you want to have some vegetables, if you want to have some fruits, if you want to have some, some rice, that's fine. But as long as you're ha eating meat at every meal, that's the most important uh, factor. And this all goes back to, like, if, uh, if you've heard of Weston Price. So yeah. Weston Price was a dentist who, he was actually, early 1900s, they were, this was the beginning of, People were thinking about vegetarian diets and he went, traveled the world to look for, you know, uh, societies that haven't been touched by civilization and see what they ate. He was expecting to see that oh, yeah. all the healthiest people 
have the most veg vegetable heavy diet. But what he found is that all societies had a basic protein and fat from animals that was their staple. And the, the additions of things on the side were variable depending on their location and their geography. And so, so that's the key for me. So, so um, it, I, I'm, I'm thinking uh, the American dietary guidelines say we should have something silly like 50 grams of protein and they don't specify animal based something around 50 grams yeah. and like granted i'm privileged enough to where i can get 50 grams of animal based protein a meal you know what i mean that's like my goal 50 to 60 grams of, of yeah. and usually it's animal based um does i would assume that goes back to the maybe not ansel keys himself but uh similar kind of guidelines where why it is i guess what i'm asking is is the reason uh the recommendations for protein is so low is, is that simply a money thing is there actual science to back up that we our bodies don't need that much there's no science to back it up the science that looks at these studies at proteins usually looks at you know we're giving people soy protein and uh and we see that they're not doing as well. So th that's usually when they vilify protein and they, they extrapolate it to, to meat as well. So those are the studies. The, the, the other main thing why, and this is, you read about this in my brother's book, The Fiat Standard. Uh, money printing, inflation, and they want to hide that. So how do they hide that? They make the meal less nutritious and, oh, you can still afford the meat, but nobody talks about that. It's nutrient value has gone down. Instead of eating a steak, you are now offered the, a soy burger and you're told, oh, you are getting the, the, the amount of protein that you need. Well, what's the phrase uh, you uh, give them bread and circus and they will never revolt. So. Give them, yeah. give them highly processed uh, seed oils and Netflix, <laughs> and they'll never revolt. And it works. It unfortunately works. So if I could kind of like, so meat-based, avoid highly processed foods. Um, you're not anti-carb per se, but it seems like the way they fit all of those things that are bad for us are through the carbs or through certain plant-based proteins. Am I getting that right? You. I'm low carb. I'm pro low carb. The, the percentage is depending on your lifestyle, depending on where you live. If you yeah. are in a cold environment, you should not be eating fruits every day. I think like in the winter, because you, sure. you want to think about, uh, the environment around you and what grows there. Cause that suits better with you energetically. You know, if you, if you're growing, live in a tropical environment, it's fine for you to have fruits daily, but if you're in the cold, then if fruits don't grow around you, you should not be eating them. Okay. Uh, people that are very active can tolerate more carbs. Uh, I've sense. generally found that I, I do better with a zero to low carb. Yeah. And I, I'm kind of there too. Like for a while, I tried to be anti-carb and energy levels, you know, whatever. And now my carbs, if I have them, are going to be fruit-based potato sweet potato definitely not processed that's kind of where i'm at so we got we got the high proteins we got lowish carbs depending on lifestyle and, and i think the most important one that you pointed out to me is to become your own doctor you know be concerned about your own health and that's not saying go on webmd and you know figure out what that always says it, it's just like what's the word uh, that proof of work, you know, you got to put in the time to understand how your body works, right? 100%. And so, this, uh, this again goes back to the fiat aspect, which is, I mean, it's a very fiat idea to think that you have to work eight hours a day, every day, <laughs> because that's just taking away from your time with your own self and with your family. And that's just going to, what's going to make you dependent on the system. And if you look at people, well, how productive are they in that, those eight hours of work, you know, they're working for an hour, basically. <laughs> I feel that. Yeah. I feel that a lot. So, uh, so you said that you're waiting for your visa to clear, and then 
after that? How, what what kind of timeline are you on? Because I'm interested in uh, seeing. Hopefully, your in the next year or two, I'll be free, and uh, I'm starting to just post things online to get the word out there. And hopefully, eventually, I'll be have I'll have my own online consulting service where nice. people can talk to me. So um, aside from Twitter, I have you at a m m o u s m d amus yes. m d dot com. Is there anywhere else that you'd like to send the listener? I think that's that's mainly it. I I have a website amusmd.com. dot com. It's still on the in the works, but it's out there. All right. Well, Ahmad, this has been fascinating. I mean, everything that you've been saying on Twitter that I've been following is on point. It's just fire, and I 100% agree with it. I mean, N of one, I've been following what you've been saying, and at 46, I feel better than I did at 36. I mean, that's that's no lie. So thank you for speaking truth to power. <laughs> thank you for continuing to let the uh, let the people know that there is a way, there's a way out of this mess. Um, so thank you for all you do. Thank you for joining me on Zoom Out as well. Dr. Amadamus. Thank you, Tim. It was a pleasure. All right. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Take care.